Sure, it's uh, wonderful to be able to invite you to start uh, with your first talk for the John Main Seminar for 2016, our 25th anniversary year. And when you first led the seminar in 1990 in London, it was the beginning of a, a warm and inspiring friendship in which you have shared yourself and we've been able to share with you various stages of evolution in our community. And I want to thank you for that, for your, for your friendship and for your advice and wisdom. And uh, this is a very significant moment, uh, especially this year with the possibility of our having the center in France, which uh, Sandrine mentioned. So you're a very precious and important part of our story, and I want to thank you for that, and thank you for accepting to lead this seminar again. And just as a sign of what has happened in these years, uh, the last quarter of a century, I'd like to also give you this report, The Heart of Education, which is our report on our work with meditation with children and young people in many parts of the world, which a sharing of this contemplative wisdom that unites us with you. So thank you again. I have to give you your, I'll give you that, I have to put it there, put there. <laughs> leave it there, good. Here's this. Good morning. Good morning. Lawrence yesterday talked about the cracks in ourselves, but fundamentally the cracks in our world. I remember in 1939, I was here in France on a holiday with my father and mother and brothers. And we heard of the German inv invading Poland. And my father who had been in the trenches from 14 to 18, He knew what it meant. Somewhere there's been a sort of a desire, a cry for peace. But there's something very fundamental as you look at the history of humanity. Warfare. And uh, you will find in all the big cities, you know, big streets and monuments to the generals, to the marshals, to the admirals, to the, who've won the war. But there's something very interesting happening today. Because of communications, the internet, the smartphone, the God knows what, Everybody's in communication with everybody. So in some way, the walls are falling down. But we're all in a sort of intertwined reality. Something is changing. And yet, that struggle about unity of humanity through power something deeply wedded. And you see this. And we're living on a sort of volcano. And you hear of North Korea with their submarines and their ballistic missiles. And 
And you hear of, you know, Turkey going in and then Syria, Iraq, terrorism. So all, we're all part of a huge and horrible and frightening history of death, life through power, the need for power. And the story of that is an amazing and and it all began, and I like to say a few words about the book of Genesis, how Adam revolted because somewhere he was tempted by more knowledge which will give more power. It's a temptation. More knowledge, more power. So there was a revolution because the invitation of God was to remain silent and listening. So there was that revolt and God came to visit Abraham, sorry, Adam. Adam, where are you? This was shortly after the revolution. And Adam said, I'm frightened because I'm naked and I hid. Three things, fear, nakedness, hiding. Nakedness. The nakedness is the crack. I feel poor. I feel powerless. I don't know what to do. I'm lost. So right from the beginning, not the beginning of the beginning, but the beginning of that movement, is frightened. And Lawrence brought up this question of fear. It would be very important for each one of you to look at what is the most fearful thing that can be to you. Remember a meeting we had here with a lot of the leaders of Lash to talk about how human beings grow through proximity with the weak. And somewhere fear came up. And then everyone talked about the fundamental fear. What was amazing out of 30 people who have been in Laos for a long time, their fundamental fear for each one was very different. Fear of failure, fear of not being loved, fear of suffering, fear of death. I mean, it was. It was interesting to see what is the fundamental fear. Because the fundamental fear can guide uh, the way we live, the choices we make. Unless we become conscious of what that fundamental fear is, we won't eliminate fear, but at least we can name it and not let it guide our decisions. I was frightened because I was naked. And so I hid. I must hide, I must hide the cracks. And maybe that is something about humanity, <coughs> hiding the cracks, hiding our poverty. We have to show we are better than the others. Lawrence talked about that, the need for acclaim, the need for power, the need to forget our fundamental fragility, our poverty. We didn't decide our lives. We were conceived in our mother's womb, and, and Lawrence brought up that, and I'll come back to that amazing nine months that we live in the womb of our mothers. And then that period of, 
of birth, with very fundamental things come. And if also it's the time of what Lawrence called the primal wound, that primal wound where we need to be enfolded, held. But come back to Adam and entered violence, entered violence. Cain murdered his brother. Here we have the beginning, the murdering of the different one, the one more fragile, the murdering, the pushing down, the power that pushes people down. So we have this huge vision of humanity. It's, it's always a painful and yet beautiful. The Tower of Babel, well, we wanted to build a tower where we would have that power. But then it all broke up because people spoke different languages. And there's a word that God regretted that the human beings had been created. And then Noah, the first covenant with humanity. And the rainbow, which will be the sign that there's a link, a bond between God and humanity, a humanity that's become violent. So then the story of great people, the covenant with Abraham. An incredible man, that Abraham, the father of faith. And we forget him that he was led, he left everything and let himself be led, not knowing where he was going. A man of peace. And fro from him, we would discover the new covenants. Moses, the liberator. And maybe we're all looking for a liberator to remind us that the Passover is the feast of liberation, and which Lawrence brought in, the metanoia. What do we need to be liberated from fear? What is it that we need to be reborn so that we're not controlled by fear, but by peace? And so, from the the great prophet Moses, who heard God say, I've heard the misery of my people. I've heard the pain of my people. Go. But what is your name? Because I have to tell them, I am. I am who I am. Yes, God is. But in our world, there's this struggle. And we know there's the struggles in each of us. And then the great prophets. We have to come back to these great prophets like Isaiah, Jeremiah, Joel, Ose, Amos. And then the birth of Jesus. The Prince of Peace. Isaiah, sorry, St. Paul in Ephesians says, Jesus is our peace. Of the two groups, he has made one. Destroying the dividing wall of hostility that separated them. A world separation. Jesus is our peace. That they may be one as the Father and I are one. And he came to bring together all the children of God 
into unity, unity. So we're in that struggle. The world, the community, you know your vision is coming together into that place of silence, sometimes struggling with the mantra to go deeper into that place of silence. And as you know in Lash, it's to welcome people who have been, and I mentioned that the other day, pushed away, seen as a punishment from God. So somewhere it's about bringing people together. So we have our mission, the vision, the mission of Lash is to somewhere about healing and helping people to grow, to discover. And the same thing through meditation, that silence, in which Lawrence said that that is the road of holiness. So we're right there, but the mission is even greater than the mission of Lash is not just helping people who were pushed aside to help them to discover their humanity, but we each of us have a mission of peace, bringing people together. on a road of holiness, road of peace. Somewhere there's our immediate mission, but then there's the utopia. The utopia is maybe our dream. What is that utopia? It's the dream of Jesus, peace, peace. So it's not just to welcome a few people here in Lach, but it's to work for unity, bring people together, people who were despised for many centuries, seen as no good, evil, and they are part of the human family. And so also with the world community, bringing people together to be in silence, to discover that primal innocence, discover what is deepest. And there, and Lawrence brought it to us, there, a presence of God. Etty Hilsom says something. She says, I'm beginning to discover that I am a well, and at the bottom of the well, there is God. But then she adds, but so often I cannot get to that well because there's a lot of garbage between being in contact with the well and preventing me. So we have to get rid of the garbage. That's the struggle, that's the crack that prevents us getting in contact with what is deepest within me, that primal innocence, the place of God our well. And maybe the whole of the message of the world is that to help each one to discover the source, the well. And doing that, working for peace, bringing people together. In Lash, we can only welcome how many people when the needs, that's why we say that Lash is a sign, it's not a, 
We don't resolve all the problems. But somewhere in that sign, it's about peace. Peace. Bringing people together. Meeting. Helping people to meet each other and discover in each other that primal innocence. I'd like to just share with you one or two stories about the people we welcome in Larche. And I say it's so little. I had a letter from a man. We have five communities in India. And you know the population of India. And this man who had started a small workshop, he said, in the area that I'm in, there's evaluated 30,000 people with disabilities. And only 1% get a little help. So, what can we do? It's so small, and some of the questions that I heard yesterday is, in front of the bigness of the violence and the running for atomic warfare, the submarines, so that we can send off missiles, the accumulation of armaments, so small, all we can do. In that area of India, 30,000 kids with disabilities. And we can only welcome in our homes maybe 15, 20, but then have an outreach with families, which might be another 20. What is that? It's so little. And we can sometimes be confused because of the relationship of the big and the little. We hear through all the medias the frightening things, the preparations for war or the murders or the terrorism and so on. And sometimes we're in front of the, the bigness what can we do? How can I live compassion when there's, with all the things we know, the millions of refugees, the situations here or there? What do we do? And then, the answer that we give, which Lawrence gave us yesterday, go into yourself. Discover that primal innocence. Discover, yes, discover that at the bottom of the well there is God. And yet, as we discover God, and Lawrence helped us yesterday, it's not cutting us away from everything. But the, we are one of those in a vast humanity who want to be searchers for peace and to find life, find eternal life within ourselves, find eternity. We can't resolve all the problems, but we can go deeper. That again is what Etty Hilsom says, that peace will only come if each one of us become men of peace, and then little by little it will radiate out. And it's what Lawrence was saying, as we go deeper we find wisdom. We're not cut off from the world, but somewhere we want to hold it. We had here in Lash a, a year ago a Swiss psychologist. 
Lita Bassett. And she came and talked about looking at others with kindness. How to look at people with kindness, with gentleness. And somebody said, but how can I look at a terrorist or jitardist with kindness? She just said, do you pray for them? Do you pray for them? These are wounded kids, caught up in an ideal of power and of violence, because many of them were just so lonely. The sins of the Western countries is so often the sins of individualism. Where the dangers of others could be in a tribal reality of tribalism. So somewhere our hearts are to be changed, and that's all that Lawrence gave her with the metanoia, the liberation, the Moses. And Jesus came as the liberator. That's what Easter is about, the resurrection. It's, it's a metanoia, it's a change, a gift to become a, a place of peace. And the signs of those presence of God within us. Silence. Uh, one of the realities we are called to live is meeting people. We welcomed Pauline some years ago it had a viral disease, a leg, arm paralyzed, leg paralyzed, epilepsy. She came here when she was 40. And, uh, but what was characteristic of Pauline was violent, very violent woman. She couldn't strike at people because of her paralyzed leg, a paralyzed arm, but she could throw herself on the ground and scream and, and it's not easy when you welcome someone who is so battered, so hurt. We had a very good psychiatrist at that time, and, and we asked him, how can we welcome, because our houses are small, maybe we would welcome eight or nine people like Pauline, with a few people who'd be there living together. And he said, you know, for 40 years, she has been humiliated. Humiliation. You're no good. You're an idiot. You're stupid. Debile. Handicapped. The family wanted a, a beautiful child. Yes, you understand. And here she is with all her physical cracks, but more deeply, the wound of humiliation, school, laughed at, mocked at. How people with disabilities can be laughed at. And then in the streets, Things are changing, maybe a bit, 
and many of them are being aborted. Because we don't want the different. We're fearful of the different. Why this fear of the different? Why this fear of Pauline? Yes, she had difficulty verbalizing. Yes, she had difficulty in school, obviously. Obviously, she had physical difficulties and epilepsy and so on. But our world doesn't want that. Just as our world is becoming a bit tormented, tormented by the whole question of old age, Alzheimer, the loss of memory. Who are these people who sometimes can no longer speak? Their memory has been clouded over. But maybe somewhere the rejection of Pauline and maybe the rejection of some people with Alzheimer's and the whole reality that we're talking about, assisted suicide. Maybe we're all frightened of our own fundamental cracks. I'm nearly 88. Two years' time, I'll be 90. I was always told that 80 was old and 90, oh my God. <laughs> so I'm on the down track. Some of you are there and others on the up track. But we're there. We're there with this movement of what it means to be human. <coughs> and to be human is always to live loss and gain. We'll come back to the mystery of loss and gain. The first fundamental loss was when we came out of the womb of our mothers. We'd been there free of charge, nine months. And it's super, you know, free lodging, free food, free... And suddenly, when the time has come, the time has come, the hour. A world of the infinite, light, air. The cry of the child to fill up the lungs, the cry, the scream, scream of anguish, the scream of the lungs. But mom is there. From the anguish of birth with the discovery of light and the infinite horizons and beyonds. So life is about that the loss and then the discovery. Then the child must lose, leave those arms. And mum mustn't hold on too much. That difficult thing of being in love and helping to go forward. And that's the story. And the time when we can no longer work. The time as we go on. This continual movement of loss. And we're all frightened of loss. Fear of loss fear of the future. I was frightened because I was naked, so I hid. We have to discover those hiding places. And many of those hiding places, and Lawrence brought it, the fantasies, the ideas, the, the running away from reality. And we're running away from the reality of our own selves. The fear of Pauline or the fear of old age. That's who I'll be. Maybe we're frightened of, and that's 
exactly what Adam says at the beginning. I was frightened because I was naked, so I hid. I hid away. I don't want to look at reality. I'm frightened of reality. And I'm frightened of those that some way signify reality to me. Pauline, others, the old. So, to come back and discover the light coming through the cracks, that we're all in this mystery of loss and gain. And the cracks open up wider, the light becomes greater. There is the secret of meditation going deeper. Reality. And at the bottom, at the very bottom of the well, there's God. It's extraordinary. So there's this pathway. The struggle, yes, we have the mantra to keep away those voices which want to hide. Come back to the reality and the discovery that at the bottom of the well there's presence. A presence. A real presence. Come back to Pauline. Our psychiatrist that you know she has been so humiliated. She's just been told she's no good. That nobody wants her. Her violence is a cry. Her violence is a cry. Does anyone want me? Does anyone love me? Am I someone? Or am I just dirt? <coughs> to be rejected, to be put on the garbage. The cry. And we have to remember that violence is so often a cry. Violence frequently comes from humiliation. And if we know a little bit about history, is when we push people down because we've won, they will come back with more violence. The Treaty of Versailles, which humiliated Germany. So when Hitler started rising up, the vengeance. And that is the story, maybe, of a lot of the situations of Islam. Humiliation. And then one day... Uh, so violence can be a cry. Does anyone want me? Does anyone love me? Does anyone see within me something of value? Humiliation. The answer to humiliation, violence, or the cry. The cry of the baby. The cry of anguish of the baby. As he comes out from the womb of the mother, who am I? In front of this infinite light and distance. And the cry. But the answer to the cry, you are my beloved daughter, my beloved son, do not be afraid. So the cry of Pauline, the violence of Pauline, and he said, you must listen to her.
To listen is to be silent. To listen to the cry. Here we have something where we are together. You can only listen if you're deeply silent. You can't listen if you're bubbling up with news. To be empty, to take in what you have to say. A friend of mine who was leader in Australia of LASH before being leader worked in the world of prostitution. And she told me this story that one day she entered the park of Sydney and she saw a young man dying of an overdose. And his last words before he died in her arms was, you've always wanted to change me. You've never wanted to meet me. You've never, you've always wanted to change me. You've never wanted to meet me. To meet. That means to listen. Tell me your story. That young man has a story. Tell me your story. And as we hear the story, maybe we begin to weep because you've suffered too much. That's Mother Teresa. She was in Calcutta at the Loreto Convent looking after the children of good families. We don't quite know what good families are, but that's what they said, the good families. Those who could pay. But then she came out and she would see on the streets people sick, people dying. It's not possible just to look after a few families when all those that are on the streets. So she went through a, a metanoia, a change. We can't leave this like that. It's not possible. And each one, there's a story. Tell me your story. We love to change people. Because then we have a bit of power. I will change people. I'm on the good side and you're on the no good side. So we can continue in a world of generosity and doing good things. But tell me your story. because there's no difference between you and me. So if our stories are different, our stories, yes. But the story of that young man is a story, yes, like all children, this nine months in the womb of mom, and, but then what happened? Out in the streets, get into the gangs, introduced to drugs, catch people up into that world, initiate people into the drug world. And then to find money for the drugs, prostitution and all the rest, yes. Story, the story. But we all began in the same way. Flowing from the heart of God as we were conceived, in the womb of our mothers. We spent those nine months, the beginning of this journey, a beautiful journey, a 
but also a very painful journey. So listening implies silence, not to interrupt. Tell me your story. When I hear the story, it's painful. And I feel lost. My story is another story of blessing. The story of the young man is a story of malediction, pain, rejection. Tell me your story. So, here we're beginning to coming together, silence. A silence which will lead us into this mysterious holiness as we touch the bottom of the well, a presence of God, but also a silence as we listen to this boy, or to listen to the story of Pauline. And then something happens as we come together, a moment of communion with Pauline. For I'm not there to tell you what to do, I'm there to meet you. On one side, contemplation, which leads to an inner silence and a meeting with the eternal. And on the other, a meeting which will lead to a communion, a meeting of silence. So we see how the world community and Lash we're coming together in a mystery of silence. A silence which is a listening to the cry of the poor. Not necessarily doing something, but hearing it. Maybe all of you know Francis of Assisi. He is a beautiful man. Just want to tell you a little bit of the story of Francis. He wanted to be a winner. He wanted to be a knight with armor. That was his dream of success a power, with all the young ladies of Assisi running after him, he with his horse and... I won't go into all the elements of his story, but he fought in a war against Perugia, Assisi and Perugia, 40 kilometers. He was taken prisoner. He spent a year imprisoned, then he had two years of some strange sickness. Was it depression? Was it some mental sickness? He touched what was deepest within him, his poverty. People speak very little about this time of pain. Some of the great people of peace, like Mahatma Gandhi, went through a very particular time of pain when he was rejected from the train going from Jahan Durban to Johannesburg or Pretoria. 
thrown out because he was colored, Indian. And he was sitting there at the train in the cold, not knowing what to do. Mahatma Gandhi touched a poverty, sorry, Francis touched a poverty. Maybe we all have to touch a poverty at some times. Anguish, loss, loneliness. Maybe we have to, to touch it. Maybe we have to, like Francis, touch at the bottom where we feel completely lost, pushed aside. Francis says in his testament, the first number of his testament is this, I always had lepers in repulsion. In Europe, in the Middle Ages, Historians say there are 20,000 leprosiums, the leper. You know that when somebody saw the white spot, the sign of leprosy, get out, get out of the house. So they lived a rejection, and we hear of them in the Gospels. They would run to be around in little groups ringing a bell, saying, we're coming which meant people run away because leprosy was contagious. So terrible rejection, seen as a sickness of the devil. So the lepers were the, the horrified, terrible, a sign of evil because parts of the body would fall, the nose, the fingers, the legs. Some of you maybe have visited leprosiums. You know the situation. And you can understand this young man who wanted to be a knight in armor. Repulsion. The pus, the smell, the horror, the rejection. Get out of the house, get out of the family. They were the dung of the earth, the dung of the earth. And Francis says, he always had them in repulsion. And then one day, he felt called by the Lord to be with them. So, he entered into their company, not with medication in his pockets, no. He came to be with them, to listen. Tell me your story. To weep with them. He couldn't do anything. There was a whole culture around the leper, and the rejection of the leper, and the so on. But he was with them. He didn't do for them. Enter into a relationship, friendly, listening. He came to be their friend. A healing friendship, a moment of communion. Somewhere the mystery, the struggle, and we have the mantra to push away the voices of the world of violence and power. The whole <laughs> mantra is there to push away in order to lead us into more deeply the place of that silence, which the, uh, yesterday afternoon Lawrence revealed that that passage was a passage of love. 
because God is love. And anyone who loves knows God, for God is love. That is what John says in his letter. To be in love. Which means a dying to those voices of power or whatever it is. For Francis, the death of that need to be in armor and to be a knight. But somewhere to open up his heart, to listen to the story. Not to change people, but to be with them. And to reveal to them, just by presence, you are more beautiful than you dare believe. Because you, the leper, you, Pauline, you're a child of God. You're part of this vast family of humanity. You are precious. And so, and yesterday Lawrence helped us to go down into the silence, but that doesn't cut us away from the insecurity, the violence, and the struggle of the world. There's maybe not much I can do but I can hold people in that silence. Buddha, in a beautiful ways, some of, in Buddhism, and in one of the stages of Buddhism, is to look kindly at people. And frequently it's seen as one of the first moves to look kindly. And they would say that, that in a meditation it's looking kindly at oneself, giving thanks, looking kindly with friends, giving thanks, looking kindly at those who are seen as enemies, but seeing deeper than all those elements of enmity, the primal innocence. It means I have to work through the angers within myself or the fears to hold on to those who are the enemies. Something very beautiful in some of this movement in, you find in Buddhism. The second movement is in compassion and the third which I found very beautiful, is to rejoice because some people are entering into the mystery of silence in a way that is better than myself. To rejoice that others are moving in the right direction more beautifully. Something very beautiful. So, we gather together in Silence. Silence to listen to the Word of God. In the Vatican Council, as in Gaudium et Spes, beautiful text upon what is the dignity of the human person. And it says that the dignity of the human person is the conscience. Then it says, what is that conscience which is in every person? That conscience is the sacred sanctuary. The sacred sanctuary where God speaks to every person, orientating them to that which is true and beautiful and just, and loving, and turning away from all that is unjust, and 
untruthful, non-loving. So that secret sanctuary in each person where we can listen to the voice of God. But as Eddie Hilmson says, we have to clear away the garbage. To listen to the voice of truth. Already, the prophet Jeremiah said, in the name of God, that I will put my law into your hearts and then you will need no more to be taught because you can listen inside of yourself to the voice of truth. Silence. A silence which is listening to the voice of God within us, that conscience orientating me to do what is right in our human family, to do what is love, to do what is just, not to change the world, because we cannot, but to do what is just and right and loving there where I am, in my community, my family, my work. We don't have to go far today where I am to be, to listen to that secret voice of God orientating me to what is just and truth and love and turning away from all that can lead me into the the world of violence and proving that I'm better than you and then pushing you down. To be part of, part of this great desire of God to bring all people. Those words of Ephesians, Jesus is our peace. Of the two he has brought to one, destroying the barrier that separated them, bringing people together. At last, it's so little. Yes, it's Pauline, it's others, with their cry, with the, the world community bringing people together, to that interiority where we can begin to listen to the voice of God and rest in God. Remain in my love, Jesus. Remain in my love. Remain in God. Yes, maybe I want to change the world, but that is not the question. It's to live in the reality, my reality today, which is to remain in God and be with those who I'm meant to be. To live my reality today. And my reality, yes, it's small. It's small. We're not there to change the world, but we can get caught up in the desire of the ideal, of the big, of the change. We can only change as we let ourselves be changed and look kindly at those around us. Forgive, because that is the secret. Living to loving, kindly people is about forgiveness, reconciling. It's holding in one's heart the enemy to pray, because I can't do anything else. But what I can do is hold those terrorists and others 
in prayer. But then there's this, the demon of we have to do the big. No. The whole mystery is to be myself where I am and to let myself clear some of the garbage, to let the Spirit of God come a bit more within me, to live those moments of meditation. And for us in Lash, to listen more attentively to the Paulines, and reveal to Pauline you're more beautiful than you dare believe. For Pauline, it takes a long time, the healing. It's a long time. For her to discover that the assistants are there not to do good to her, but to enter into relationship, to be her friend, to laugh and to sing and to dance, sometimes to weep together, to go out, to buy things together. It's all so little. It takes time. And of course, Pauline grew older. That's the story. And at one time, her legs were not strong enough to carry her body, and she had to go back into a wheelchair. She was furious, lack of autonomy. She needed assistance to help her take her bath and all the rest. But there again, she had to discover the magical word. I need your help. I can't do it all alone. So as she grew older, she lived the magical word, community. I can't do it on my own. I need help. I would sometimes visit her in her home, and I would be there in the home, and sometimes I'd sit next to her, and we would talk. I remember at one time, with her good arms, she put it on my head, and she said, poor old man. <laughs> it takes time to go from violence to tenderness. It's a journey. It's a journey of all of us to discover that love is to discover that Pauline who had been so humiliated as something special to give to our world. So on one side, there's contemplation which leads to silence, and on the other side, meetings. Where I'm not better than you, but we meet heart to heart. The contemplation leads to a deepening of silence, a meeting leads to moments of silence where she puts her head, her hand on my head. And there's a communion in silence where we come together to realize that we're all part of one human family. And somewhere inside of that coming together, silence. Silence which not, never an emptiness. It's the place of communion. The place of communion. In the home in which I live, there's a man called Philip. He's schizophrenic quite seriously. But we've been together now for 40 years. And I remember sitting with him one day, 
and he just put his hand on my hand. And we stayed there. No word, silence, communion. And then he took it away. A moment of communion where barriers are broken down. He's no longer schizophrenic. He's Philip. He's a child of God. And I, I'm just also a child of God. But we're together. Communion. And that's what we live also as we go into our periods of silence together. To be silent. But maybe we're holding the hand of God. Or God is holding our hand. And it's important. It's a road to wisdom. It's a road to where we can become, each of us in our way, a messenger of peace in a world which is seeking more and more armaments for a unity of power. And we are being called into a communion where we have to, yes, and what Lawrence helped us, we have to go through places of austerity, of fidelity, to be faithful to the meditation, to be faithful to the meetings, because we need that austerity of never just pushing the meditation aside every day. Because for us, it's to meet at the meals, people of listening. But somewhere we're together in a yearning to bring people together so that the plan of God, the extraordinary plan of God, that they may be one as you, Father, and I are one, you in me and I in them, that we may be together. So it's on one side, the everyday little things, and then there's the utopia, the dream, that we're on a road together, on a road to unity, to peace, to the fulfillment of the plan of God, to be the followers of these great prophets like Abraham, Moses, Jesus, and then the other prophets, like Mahatma Gandhi and Martin Luther King and many others, but bringing people together to live communion, each one according to our grace and to our mission, to become men and women who let the Spirit of God come within us, so that we can see people through the eyes of kindness and reveal to people you are more beautiful than you dare believe. 